the historical, the historical society is at the top of the Catterskill Clove. And we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Um, since 1973, we have been discovering, preserving, and interpreting and sharing the history of the great Northern Catskills. Many of our programs follow our signature approach and combine history with hiking. Um, we have a 50 acre campus. We have a fully restored 1913 UND train station listed on the national and state historic registries. Uh, we serve as a trailhead for the Catterskill Rail Trail. Um, we have a visitor center with an archive that contains some 7,000 artifacts. Our next virtual program is on April 6th. Delaware County historian Diana Galusha will speak about the Civilian Conservation Corps in Tannersville and other locations in the Catskills. For more information about this program, please go to our website, www.mths.org. Also, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram for other updates. And everybody is really familiar with Zoom now, and if you, would, uh, you can use the Q&A function to ask questions at the bottom of the screen. Um, individual microphones and um, video screens are, are disabled and chat is also disabled. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Johanna Titus. She is a longtime resident of the Hudson Valley in the Catskills and a member of the Mountaintop Historical Society Board of Directors. As chair of our program committee, she has been responsible for planning our diverse programs and presentations on topics of historical interest. Johanna retired as a professor of biology at Dutchess Community College. She is a journalist and author. She focuses her historical research and writing on notable women of the mountaintop. Her articles have appeared in our newsletter, The Hemlock, and in Catskill Tri-County Historical Views. With her husband, who was sort of there in the background, Robert, Johanna has offered, authored several books, including The Hudson Valley in the Ice Age, The Catskills in the Ice Age, and The Catskills, A Geological Guide. The Tituses often combine their interest in science and geology with their love of art. Recently, they gave a webinar for the Cary Institute in Dutchess County on the Hudson River School of Art and its Ice Age origins. It was fascinating. Last year, as part of our annual celebration of extraordinary mountaintop women, Johanna presented the story of Bernadine Blissett Wesley, a noted engineer, civil rights activist, and Haynes Falls resident. The story of Era Zistel Posselt is just as fascinating. Johanna will reveal unexpected insights into a very unique individual whose story and connection to the Catskills has been nearly forgotten. Please join me in welcoming Johanna. Take it away, Johanna. <laughs> Hi, thank you. And thanks to all of you tonight. Let me see if I can share my screen. Oops. I'm going to go away here. Need a few minutes. <laughs> ah, good. Okay. And I will get that started. There we go. Well, tonight we're going to at an extraordinary woman, uh, an author, a librarian, and a profound animal lover who fell in love with and adopted the mountaintop as her home. There are gaps in the story here and there, but I think we have enough to form a very nice narrative. And also get a little insight about her husband too. Aris Estelle was born in 1904 and grew up in the town of Kaniot in Northern Ohio, shore of Lake Erie. Her family, like many who lived in, were connected to the lake and they were mostly part of the boat building. She graduated from Kaniot High School in 1920 and went to Western Reserve 
for women that is now, of course, Western Reserve University or Case Western Reserve University. And she graduated in five and that is her yearbook picture from the university. Um, I don't know exactly what kind of degree with. I do know that at the time there was a separate library school with the system. Uh, so she may have actually graduated from there. She could also have had a degree in library science, uh, English, any of those, but we don't know that's lost to history. During her college years, <clears throat> she apparently caught the acting bug and was a member of the Curtain Players during her third and fourth year. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you, whoops, uh, paraphrasing from her words, taken from a 1988 The Daily Mail. So she said she worked in Cleveland Public Library and eventually landed in Chicago, acting with companies. And she says it's mostly ingenue parts. So you can take that for what it's worth. She played at theaters like the Kedzie Theater and Theater in Chicago. And these are theaters that were the equivalent of theaters in New York City. Uh, she did some modeling and played some small parts on the radio. An article in the January 26 edition, 1926, of the Chicago Billboard reported that among the recent uh, placements of Bennett Dramatic are the following, Eris Estelle, Bruce Kent, Lynn Wilson, Wilson Bryce, and Al Lawrence, with Harry Minturn at the Ambassador in Chicago. And this is a picture of the Ambassador. It is still open and still running today. She was also the subject of a column in the Decatur Review, and it a column called the Commodore Line, and it was written by someone named Atlas. And it running narrative of a trip that they took either by train from either Ohio or Chicago to New York City. And he talks to her about what she's been doing. And the very interesting things that she did before she got on this, that she did, did what I, I would call voiceovers, um, talkies, early talkies. And she told him that she was carefully in order that her words might be synchronized with the movement women in the movie and she said she worked in a sound almost airtight where it's impossible to work for more than 10 or 15 minutes and her first picture was called lilac time she also did a revival of another film that was called 10 Nine. so that's what she was doing on her um, she lived in New York City in the Flatiron District on Fifth Avenue, and this is her building. Still there, a little kind of run down, I guess, but none. And she moved there before 1929. 1929, she married 
a Louis Lavar. There aren't any further records that I could find about Mr. Lavar happened to end their marriage. Um, Era Zistel Lavar Basalt, which may hint may have been widowed. Then sometime between 19 and 1940, she met and married Eric Passal, who had also been married before. And together they bought in Hunter on Ontuar Park Road, where they would eventually uh, the 1940 census lists them as being married and living. This is the only picture I can find or have of Eric Passalt. And you can see he's busily handling goats. Um, he was born in Bohemia in eight, and he attended the University of Prague. He made his way to around 1914, so just before World War I, and, and worked as a translator <laughs> and reporter for the German newspaper journal. And he got in a little bit of trouble with World War I, and I'll tell you about that. He satiric, but unpublished poem, American bombing squadron. There is a report in the Eagle, uh, July 21st, 1918. One alien poet wrote what he hadn't he gloated at his ghastly jest, and now he's caught. There's a poem about a bombing squadron, and it was written here with uh, the poem about 10 little Indians, and it goes from 10, 9, eight, and there were none. Well, his goes from the six aviators and goes, and by today's standards, this is very mild, I would say. I can read you the first stanza if you'd like. Um, six little aviators one day, they wished to go to Cobins and never came away. And it tells one by one about them dropping. One had gout, one had thirst, and it, it's really kind of mild. Apparently, the powers that be uh, found out, raided his home, and uh, and this was the Department of Justice. And they remanded him to uh, in uh, Oglethorpe, Georgia. And he stayed there for two years. <laughs> so I guess I have to say thank you to President Wilson for his uh, sedition act. Uh, Free speech wasn't as free during the beginning of World War I. Um, while he was there, he wrote an article for the and it was condemning the who were lost to the flu epidemic in 1918. And he thought that these were German people people that had they been deported or something else been done with them, that they would have not died from this horrible. But like I said, find a marriage record for Eric and Era, because I don't exactly know where they got married, but they were 40 census as married. And for 
they commuted uh, back and forth to New York City and mostly for work. During World War II, Arrow worked for the Office of War Information in Manhattan. Uh, that was opened between 1942 and 1945. And she claims that she worked there on secret information. Um, I can't confirm that, but I mentioned it might be true. Um, both were also writing and working translations from the German language. And the first on was a book that's called Favorite Stories Old and New. Um, she isn't listed as the author, but uh, it may also be that she translated it for the author. And in that way, she was associated This is the front door of their home on Antiora Park Road. Um, and a book, another of Eric Pasalt's uh, under. It's a collection of songs edited by Eric, military for servicemen, favorite songs that they might have had. But the problem was that some of them were so bawdy or considered today that the post office refused to deliver copies of the book. So he's still in a little bit of trouble, I guess. And then her first book was A Treasury of Cat Stories. It's a book of stories that she edited and put together. And it was book and it's no wonder that it was very successful she gathered stories from authors like P.G. Wodehouse who was the composer of many Broadway musicals in the 1920s and also the, the Jeeves and Wooster series if you've never seen the Jeeves and Wooster stories or read it's so fun and uh, also story from Ernest who studied and wrote books about wolves. And he was of the Boy Scouts. And he and his equally famous wife, Grace Thompson Seton, lived at Antiora Park. This is, uh, Mrs. Dell says in her intro that in sorting pieces of material, she wanted to gather stories, not about people, cat stories, and I think she was very successful in doing that. And we'll see, she followed her advice and went on to include of the hundreds of animals she encountered over the years in her own. This book had at least nine printings, and it's still in print, as are many of her books. Um, many of her stories, whether gathered for collections or written by her, be really timeless stories. Most of her books, except where noted, are really not children of a misconception. Uh, they can be enjoyed by anyone, I would say, from to adults, but they're great stories to uh, read through. He did also uh, do some books for younger people, and she wrote a golden book of cats. And uh, in 19, it was for a younger audience, and another book that we'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, I'd like to read to you a little excerpt about what her critics said about her, about her books. Eris Estelle's life with animals began one year 
in her Catskills cabin, she acquired, to her utter delight, several cats, a dog, one goat, then two, and two vivacious babies that she named Hansel and Gretel. As her collection increased, her trips to New York City, her New York City apartment finally ceased altogether. She made a home for herself, her husband, animals in the tiny rustic mountain dwelling. So by 1946, she and others explain it, she had become the guardian of too many animals. Those animals then included her dog, six cats, the two raccoons, and a couple of goats. So she moved permanently, except for very rare occasions when business in the city was necessary, to Ontiora Park Road. And she lived across the way from the Lehmans and uh, the Pasalt home was referred to as or a barn. She herself admitted to it being almost uh, it was also in 1946 that she became the Haynes librarian. And as you can see, one of the visitors or I should say residents of the library during the time that she was the librarian, the chipmunk, who uh, according to what I really thrilled a whole lot of young people that visited the library. Um, the numbers of creatures at the home kept increasing. And their property included a small barn and a feeding station, mostly for birds and and enough space for her to wander on walks each day. In 1947, she compiled her first group of dog stories, gathering from many renowned authors of the day. She chose stories that were a variety of breeds and settings that demonstrated man's love for dogs love for man. Among the authors are A.A., the author of Winnie the Pooh, Albert Payson Turcune, who wrote Latin, Booth Tarkington, who wrote The Magnificent Ambersons, Mark Zane Gray, Jack London, and once again, on Teora Park's own Ernest Thompson Seaton. Forty-nine, another cat story collection, includes more cat stories, but international sources, with both Era and Eric trans. Several of them. Era and her dog Muff, along, and this is the European edition of the Golden Book of Dog Stories. She also wrote from 1949. Meantime, um, Eric was also busy. He produced, along with the help from Arthur Lehman, who lived on the Rip Van Winkle Trail, a 1949 from Catskill to Lexington, with maps of hiking trail included extensive ads of all types in the Mountaintop Historical Society's archives, which I'm borrowing at the moment. It'll soon be back there. And he also edited, loved a book of Christmas stories, a collection of stories from around Back at the Haynes Falls Library, Era and her young assistant, Justine, received 
a new bookmobile truck. And this was in May. And it was thought to be a wonderful addition to the mountaintop that was in supplying books on loan year round, but a summer residence. Era worked at the library three days a week in and five in the summer, along with Justine and the bookmobile. Eric was busy translating the book Felix Salton, who also wrote Bambi, editing yet another book of Christmas stories, which would be his last book. Soon after he suffered a series of strokes deprived him to some degree of his use of language. That left Eric kind of high and dry, um, had to file for unemployment due to lack of transportation. She did uh, from her home to the library and back. She was uh, unemployment on appeal in April of 1957. And apparently soon after, a board member who, according to the uh, records of the board, was Mr. Hoos, referred to ERA as the B word during a meeting. And immediately after that, she resigned as librarian in July of seven, not wanting to be required to attend further board meetings her treatment. And shortly after that, Justine, librarian. She produced a lot of short stories that were published in several things, uh, including this one. And this one's who takes up residence at the Basalt home. And uh, the cat is stupid and names it boob but th that it's not stupid but blind and welcomes it as cat in her growing family soon after that she writes orphan about an orphaned raccoon another addition to the family and then the good year collection of her decision to move to the mountaintop full time. The wonder and sometimes tragedy of the mountaintop, the weather, forest fires, and just the seasons. But on a sad note, it ends with the suicide death of Eric in July of 1959. In 1963, and this is the other children that she wrote. Um, it's a bit of her books, has lots of photos of her cat, Remy. A simple text, a book that children could read easily. In 1966, she goes back to her usual narrative form with that includes stories of opossums and even a family of her barn. Sarah at a book signing in uh, for the Wintertime Cat. And this is Remy, Wintertime Cat. came The Dangerous Year about a family of skunks and about a raccoon. And yes, for a time, there was even a skunk who joined the family. I can't believe this myself, but even slept.
Thistle and Company is more adventures of the animals. Fella from 1977 is about a lost puppy. Goes through some trials and tribulations and finally finds his own forever. And these are just a few pictures of the books. Um, most of the photographs in her books, uh, there are some that are illustrated, mostly the uh, collection edited are illustrated. But other than that, most of the photos that she took herself. And that is a goat who in one of the stories is grieving over a lo another lost goat. And I think that's Hansel. And this is a picture of the raccoon family up in their little uh, outside of her house. And in 1980, she wrote Good Companions, uh, another narrative about living with animals, and also a cat called Christopher, who's learning to share its home and its mistress with. And that's Erin. I think that's. Uh, might be. And in 1993, her last book, A Gathering of... And there's outside in the winter. In uh, sometime after 1993, she moved to Tenbrook Commons in your home in Lake Katrine, where she aided Harry uh, with a book that he produced called The Overwinters. And Harry was lived down south for quite a while. He was from Haynes Falls, but lived down south. And uh, decided to come back and and it's really a historical novel of Haynes Falls. And we have uh, copies of that for sale at the Mountaintop Historical Visitor Center, if you're interested. In March of 2022, at the age of nine. And Eris Estelle, July of 1997, at the age of 93. And there are a couple more of her friends. And upon her death, she willed her property to the town of Hunter to be forever wild. And this is a shot of one of them at the scene from her property. And I believe that's Hunter Mount. Uh, I've had a whole bunch of people, the 23A group, uh, help me out here and tell some fascinating stories about ERA and the fact that in the, uh, during the hunting season, they uh, crossed their clothesline that read something to the effect these are goats, not deer. Please don't shoot them. Uh, things like that. They were very, very enamored uh, of their of all their animals, wild or domestic or somewhere in between. And so I hope you've enjoyed our little talk of and please, if you have any stories to tell us, 
let us hear in the and we'd be glad to listen to them. Oh, let's see. Um, Johanna, I, I don't know if, um, if you can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I tried to start my video, but it won't go on. Anyway, um, did you said that the um, they willed the property to the town of Hunter? Does the house still exist, or is it just land now? The house was like a, a kind of a shack, apparently, according to torn down, mm -hmm. and that's gone now. And the property is just going back to the wild. Mm -hmm. Can people walk on it? Can people explore on it? Or is it that, not that big? They can. Yeah. And they it's can. still on onto your road? Yep. OK, right, obviously. <laughs> right. OK, I don't I don't think there are any questions at, at this point in the in the Q&A, but. Um, because oh, we, I've got one. OK, good. Sylvia in Palm Harbor, Florida. Uh, and she says she's got two of our Ice Age books. And thank you so very much. Uh, yes, we were at the Gramsville Museum. We gave a talk there some time ago now for uh, reading our stuff. Okay, well, if there are, if there are no questions, um, Thank you very much, Joanne. That somebody from the 23A group would come along with a story about error, but oh well, not. the thing is she was really, really well liked. Mm -hmm. Everybody that library when she was around and uh, interacted with her in the neighborhood, give out books to the kids that came by her house. So she was very endearing to a lot of people. But outspoken, I gather. Well, about animals. Uh huh. But that the but that the library board decided that the, she she had a she had issues. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't I don't know that that was the library board. I think it was. York denied her unemployment. Oh. Uh, insurance. Okay. So. I was kind of sad about Eric. Uh, dying from yeah. suicide hmm. it's interesting yeah but he yeah he was a, he was a bit more outspoken than her i see politics and, and well, all the politics yeah right but i one thing i could was the caliber of the authors that she got to allow her to publish their stories Really, you know, think about, you know, someone like you or I going, somebody like Mark Twain's agent and saying, hey, can we borrow this story for our book? That's I don't think you get very good responses. So she, she had she had connections, I gather. Um, yeah, apparently she had some connections in New York City. Yep. Whether they were from her and what she did or... Um, uh, I'm. I really don't know. I don't know how she got these people, or use their stories in her uh, books. But did she interact with the people at Antiora Club? I mean, because they had there were there was that was very literary there. Don't there's there's nothing that I've seen mm -hmm. that would indicate that. You never know because if she had um, Ernest Tom stories in her books she may have visited him in in Ontario Park mm -hmm. library there okay all right well I guess that does it for this evening so thank you very much Johanna pardon me Johanna there actually is one question here from Peter okay. uh -huh. yeah oh good okay um I yeah I imagine she made uh quite a from her books, from the royalty, from her books, um, especially photos for them and everything else. So 
Uh, I don't think hurting for money. Uh, other, you know, exactly how much she made back then, but I imagine it was a good book also, especially his uh, travel guide for the mountaintop. He must have sold quite a bit, quite a few. And her stories, her a lot of her books are still in print. I don't know who from the royalties today, but. You can get them on Amazon. And and Jessica's asking what happened to her animals after she passed away. I I don't I I can imagine there were some people their animals every once in a while, like a skunk or a raccoon, caught them in have a heart traps and then um, sent them. And let them go, put them back in the wild. I imagine wild things, but the goats and the cats, I I really don't know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, Johanna. It's a story again of another interesting woman. Um, who graced the mountaintop and and um, added to our the the culture and the literature and and the appreciation of wild nature as well as um, animals and things like that. So thank you very much. And again, um, don't we will have another program again on April sixth with Diane Galusha on uh, the civil con civilian conservation corps. So right. I think that's probably it. And um, Jessica, I think you can end the meeting. <laughs>